Thank you very much for that introduction, Jack, and uh, thank you all for being here tonight. This show is called In Remembrance of Me because it was inspired by the discovery of a first-person appeal for remembrance and offerings by a man named Kadamua, who lived in about 735 BC in the city of Samal, today's Zinjirli, Turkey. The exhibit, first of all, showcases this discovery and the ongoing work of Oriental Institute archaeologists in the Middle East, and then connects it to the themes of commemoration of deceased ancestors and the continuation of family relationships after death that are common from Egypt to Mesopotamia and beyond, and still have resonance for many people around the world today. This is an exhibit about family, memory, and identity, and how these intersected through objects and ritual in the ancient Middle East. Then, as in most societies today, the family was the fundamental social unit. And those family relationships of duty, mutual care, and solidarity were not restricted to its living members, but extended to departed ancestors as well, from recently deceased parents, sometimes back many generations. Ancestor cult and commemoration was an important part of religious life across the ancient Middle East, because to remember where and who you came from and to be remembered in your turn was an essential part of one's identity and the perpetuation of that identity through time. Who are you without your ancestors? Who were you if you were forgotten by your descendants? But this wasn't just an existential question or remembrance in abstract terms. Ancestor cult consisted of regular concrete practices that were perceived to have tangible benefits on both sides. For the living, care for the souls of the dead was a moral and even legal condition for the inheritance of property and status. It was also an essential way of getting the supernatural on your side. Proper respect paid to the dead could protect you from the curses of a hungry, vengeful ghost, while an honored ancestor could, pro pro could provide blessings for his descendants and even intercede with the gods on your behalf. We all know this commandment to honor your father and your mother, but we often forget that the second half of the commandment is to honor them so that you may live long. For those who were looking ahead, and facing their impending mortality. Remembrance by the living was essential. And those who could tried to ensure, uh, ensure this through personal monuments, inscriptions, and even mortuary endowments. The afterlife was pictured differently from Egypt to Mesopotamia, but everyone agreed not only that some part of the living person would survive death, but also that the quality of the soul's existence was in part dependent on care and nourishment by descendants. The Egyptians said that to speak the name of the dead is to make them live again. For the Mesopotamians, the man who had no heir ate clay and drank muddy water in the underworld, while the man with seven sons sat on a throne in the company of the gods. <coughs> but how was this ongoing relationship between the living and the dead maintained? We have a fuller picture of ancestor cult from Egypt and Mesopotamia with their more extensive written records. But in the area in between, in the Levant and Anatolia, the evidence is much more fragmentary, and a lot is dependent in the past on inferences and assumptions and comparisons with other reg regions. So the discovery of the Kadamua stele from Zinjirli, and precisely this in-between area, has been very important for our understanding of ancestor cult. For once, we have both a lengthy inscription that is quite explicit about the mechanics of ancestor cult here, and the underlying beliefs. And we have it in its original archaeological context, which is extremely rare so that we can understand the life setting of this monument. So here's the Kadamua stele. Here we see a man seated in a high-backed chair, holding up a cup and a pine cone on a branch, before a dining table, bearing a bowl of flatbreads, a duck, and a small box. A winged sun disk once arched overhead, but it was destroyed by the plows of farmers repeatedly hitting the top of the stone. But here we've digitally restored it. In the inscription, which was written in the Aramaic alphabetic script and language, Kadamoa speaks in the first person, saying he set up the stele while he was still living, and he established there a sacrificial feast for a group of five gods in addition to his own soul. In the second half of the inscription, he appeals to his heirs to continue this feast annually after his death and repeat the offerings there for his soul. So here we have, on the one hand, an explicit description of annual offerings for Kadamua's soul by his descendants. And on the other hand, we learn how he was to receive these offerings. He says that his soul will be in the stone stele, and that the sacrifices should be at or even on the stele itself. These two components of ancestor cult, regular offerings to or even feasts with the dead, and interaction with the dead through the medium of stone effigies, 
were widely shared throughout the ancient Near East and Egypt. Just as everyday meals and special feasts tied the family together in life, food and drink shared with the dead at regular intervals, whether daily, monthly, or yearly, connected people to their past. And though the dead were believed to take both material and immaterial form, across the region, stone likenesses and monuments gave the soul an earthly form that could be a focus for ritual by the living. So this exhibit begins with the Katamua Stele, but then explores these two aspects of the commemoration of the dead through around 55 other objects from the OI's collections in addition to a few loans from the Metropolitan Museum and the University of Pennsylvania Museum. So who was Katamua and where did he come from? First, I want to give you a little bit of background about the site of Zinjirli, Turkey, which was the ancient city of Samal. Since 2006, the Oriental Institute's Neubauer Expedition, directed by co-curator David Schloen, has been investigating this Iron Age city, which flourished from around 900 to 600 BC, under the shadow of the Assyrian Empire was located on the cultural and geographic border between the highlands of Anatolia in Turkey to the north and the plains and river valleys of Syria and Mesopotamia to the south and east. Over 100 years ago, an expedition from Berlin has, had already traced Zinjirli's perfectly circular outer fortifications and uncovered the royal palaces on the central citadel mound. They discovered massive stone reliefs decorating the gates and palaces in the tradition of the Anatolian Hittite Empire that had controlled this area centuries earlier. But these were executed, executed in a lively local style and accompanied by royal inscriptions in the West Semitic language and alphabetic script of the Arameans who dominated much of Syria at this, at this time. Samal was one of a number of so-called Syro-Hittite kingdoms that flourished as centers of trade and craftsmanship in the early first millennium BC. The wealth and power of these kingdoms attracted the attention of the ambitious Assyrian kings of northern Mesopotamia. And one by one, they fell under Assyrian control and were absorbed by the expanding empire. The new project in at Zinjirli, initiated by the University of Chicago, has focused mainly on exploring the large residential lower towns surrounding the palaces of the citadel through both remote sensing and excavation, trying to better understand Iron Age urban life and the organization of the city. So working so far from the royal palaces excavated by the German expedition, we weren't expecting to find reliefs or inscriptions, nor even anything related to the dead. So we were really delighted when only five days after breaking ground in the northern lower town, July 21st, 2008, we uncovered the top of what seemed to be an intact inscription. So this is the young man, uh, Chara Chaten, who first brushed away the soil from the face uh, and, and saw that what we had thought was just a plow-scarred stone that we'd been tripping over for days uh, actually had writing on it. Based on the damage to that top part of the stele, we were nervous about what might lay below. So we, uh, we removed the stele with the hard soil still adhering to its face to protect it so that we could clean it more carefully um, back in our lab. So we were really thrilled to discover that beneath that plow damage on the very top, the inscription and relief were perfectly intact. As uh, David Schloen said there on that first day when we were able to see the relief and inscription in their entirety, this fellow has achieved his goal beyond his wildest dreams. He wanted his words to be commemorated for posterity, and now 2,700 years later, we have a chance to hear what he says. And we soon realized that we, he had some remarkable things to say, and that we had something special. To have the relief, the inscription, and the archaeological context together makes this an unusually rich document of religious and social life. The initial discovery made headlines. It was featured in the New York Times, was one of the most emailed articles, which I was particularly proud of, was one of Archaeology Magazine's top 10 discoveries of the year. After the first decipherment and publication of the inscription, um, as Jack was saying, our understanding of this monument has continued to grow and deepen, as not only Oriental Institute scholars, but the wider community of Near Eastern philologists, archaeologists, and art historians have weighed in on its interpretation, and as we continue to work in this part of Sanjirli. So this exhibit summarizes and the, and the accompanying catalog details the latest scholarship on the Katamua Stele and then sets it into its broader Near Eastern context. So as you enter the exhibit, you'll first see the face of the Katamua Stele in a life-size facsimile created by Staub Studios. You'll be, be able to study the relief and inscription and read the translation for yourself. So since the late 19th century, when half of the sculpture and inscriptions that were found at Zinjirli ended up over a thousand miles away in Berlin, a lot of things have changed. Today, the original Katamua Stele is close to home in the Gaziantep Archaeological Museum in the Turkish province where the site is located. But fortunately, through modern technology, 
um, we're able to experience this, this discovery for ourselves half a world away. Combining the inscription with the archaeological data has produced some intriguing insights into Katamua's afterlife beliefs. And the way that Katamua wanted to be commemorated and supported after his death seems to be an expressive statement of his particular ethno-linguistic, religious, and socioeconomic identity in a multicultural city that was on the brink of political transformation. First, excavations have established that this is not Katamua's burial place. We found no trace of his bodily remains, despite our best efforts. Yet the inscription explains that his soul is in the stone stele. This is the first statement of this kind that we have for this region. The traditional Semitic belief was that body and soul were in some ways inseparable, and that therefore the preservation of the body and the bones was very important. While among the Hittites and Luwians in Anatolia, cremation, so the destruction of the body, was much more common, which would of course require that the soul be able to survive in another form, such as a statue or a stele. So here in this city of Samal, which was dominated by Semitic Arameans, Kadamua seems to be trying to explain and perpetuate his quite different beliefs about body and soul, even while writing in the Aramaic script and language. Kadamua makes a second remarkable statement of his beliefs about the afterlife by setting up his stele not at home, not in his tomb, not in a public setting, but in a little chapel next door to a small neighborhood temple, as we now know from three seasons of excavation in this area that followed the stele's discovery. We don't know what gods this unfortunately almost empty temple was home to, but we can guess that it was one, of the, uh, one or more of the five gods named by Kadamua as recipients of animal sacrifice along with his own soul. This joint receipt of offerings alongside the gods near one of their temples recalls a line in the mortuary inscription of an earlier king of Samal found by the German expedition, which asks his heir to sacrifice to the storm god and say to the storm god, may the soul of the king eat with you and may the soul of the king drink with you. And that seems to be what Kadamua intends for himself as well. This common meal with the gods in the afterlife is a far cry from the usual dismal picture of uh, the realm of the dead in the Near East. So the Kadamua stele calls into question the common understanding among scholars that such a blessed afterlife was a privilege reserved to royalty as individuals who had a special relationship with the gods. It suggests instead that this honor was considered to be more widely accessible, at least here in this era of political change. Turning to the stele's relief image, on the one hand, it has a very traditional or even standardized design, with the deceased sitting, sitting at a banquet or offering table with cup upraised, which vividly expresses the desire that Kadamua's soul would be continually nourished in the afterlife by food and drink offerings from his descendants. On the other hand, as with the inscription, the details of the image were quite specific and personalized. In the exhibit, we use three-dimensional uh, ancient examples of the objects depicted on the stele to explore the multiple meanings, not only as um, reflections of the material world of Kadamua's day, but as both religious and status symbols. So I'm uh, sorry, there's a little, I've had a little technical glitch here. It's completely my responsibility. So I'm gonna let the, um, the anticipation of the video linger a little bit longer <laughs> until you actually enter the gallery. Um, but just to introduce the, the video briefly, um, we also wanted visitors to share in this process of discovery and interpretation of the Kadamua stele and get a feeling for what ancestor cult was like in the ancient Near East. So we worked with um, Travis Saul to create the video Remembering Kadamua, which runs on a special double screen display in the gallery. The video shows how the archeological record was translated into 3D reconstructions of the city of Samal in the days of Kadamua, his mortuary chapel and the stele itself restored to pristine condition. You'll then hear translator Dennis Pardee recite the inscription in Aramaic and in English. And finally, you'll witness the annual sacrificial slaughter and memorial feast for Kadamua's soul by his descendants. This is, of course, our interpretation of what this feast would have been like. But we've tried to be as faithful as possible to the evidence we have from the architectural setting of the stele, artifacts found at Zinjirli, contemporary reliefs of people and objects, and of course, the inscription itself. You may also watch the video uh, on, online on the OI's YouTube page um, and hear a full reading of the, um, the uh, Aramaic and English text uh, there as well. So the Kadamua stele is in some ways a highly personal document of identity and belief, but it has deep cultural and religious roots that spread throughout the ancient Middle East. These themes are highlighted in the remainder of the exhibit by objects from Egypt, the Levant, Anatolia, and Mesopotamia. 
Kadamua believed that his soul would be present in the stone stele, bearing his image, in order to receive offerings from his descendants. This idea that an image could be not just representative, but actually inhabited by an animate spirit and serve as the object of ritual was a widespread religious concept in the ancient Middle East. This section of the show presents images of the dead in all shapes and sizes from Egypt to the Levant, Anatolia, and Mesopotamia. Some of these monuments actually show the interaction between the living and the dead, as on this stele from southern Turkey. As on the Katamua stele, the deceased, who is here a woman wearing a square headdress with a long veil, is shown seated before a dining table. But here there's also a second person, a small female figure seated on her lap, who seems to represent her daughter, who was probably the commissioner of the monument for her mother. Such an intimate posture between mother and child expresses the protective relationship that continued even after death. Breaking bread together is everywhere the ultimate form of social bonding, whether among the living, between mortals and gods, or between the living and the dead. The image of a figure seated before a dining table that we find on the Kadamua stele is ubiquitous in the art of the ancient Near East and Egypt, but it doesn't always have a mortuary significance, as shown by the, the variety of objects bearing a banquet scene displayed in this exhibit. In fact, the meaning of the meal of the dead is derived from ceremonial means, uh, meals in life, whether celebrating a successful battle, a wedding, an alliance, or a hunt. This ivory chairback is several centuries older and from the site of Megiddo to the south in Israel, but you can recognize the same essential elements that we see on the Kadamua stele. Here we get the whole scene. The most honored figure seated alone at the left before the table, lesser guests seated in rows facing him, and standing servants attending them. All present are united by the social occasion, but the associated etiquette makes sure their relative rank is not forgotten. In the middle of the gallery sits a dining table covered with dishes, inviting the dead to eat and drink in our midst. The pottery and copper vessels with which the table is set were found in tombs and graves in Mesopotamia, Anatolia, the Levant, and Egypt. They represent the first food and drink offerings sent with the dead into the tomb for their journey to the afterlife. This group is a selection of the many vessels found in one particular rock-cut chamber tomb at Megiddo, Megiddo, Israel, where multiple generations were buried. With each new burial, new food and drink offerings were left, not only for the most recent tomb occupants, but in some cases also for long-dead ancestors. And the meal may have been shared among the living, uh, living family as well. This large jug with animals approaching a tree of life is known as the Megiddo vase. It was probably used to mix and serve wine. The dagger could have been used to cut meat offerings, which are represented by animal bones found in the tombs. The ideal was always that living descendants would continue to provide food and drink offerings for their ancestors in perpetuity. But the Egyptians in particular saw the evidence all around them that in time families die out, distant ancestors are forgotten, and eventually all tombs are neglected, and all mortuary cults cease, even those of the kings. The hunger of the dead would remain, however. So the very practical Egyptians invented a kind of fast food, magical methods of providing for the dead for eternity by bringing words and images to life. On this funerary stele of a man and a woman, the images of cuts of meat, baskets of food, and beer and wine jars, beer or wine jars, were not just pictures, but could supply the dead with food and drink by their presence in the tomb. Even the words could be enough. The inscription here asks any visitor to the tomb who had brought nothing in their hand to recite a voice offering instead, saying, a thousand of bread, beer, oxen and fowl, and every good thing, and thereby making it so. Finally, an epilogue to the exhibit highlights echoes of these ancient traditions that can still be found in annual festivals of commemoration around the world today. Many of you in the audience tonight may have already recognized parallels in the commemorative practices of the ancient Middle East with the memorial traditions of your own culture, whether you're Catholic and observe All Saints and All Souls Day, celebrated as the Day of the Dead in Latin America, or East Asian and remember your ancestors at Qing Ming and other festivals, or a member of one of the many other cultures and religions that come together in family groups with food and drink at tombstones, altars, and other sacred spaces to rem remember and reconnect to the dead. This past Saturday, April 5th, marked this year's Qing Ming Festival, when many people in China and other East Asian countries visit the tombs of their family members, clean and maintain them, and leave food and drink offerings for the dead. In this tradition, offerings for ancestors extend far beyond a delicious meal, and paper versions of everything from currency to clothes and furniture to the latest iPhone or iPad can be purchased to burn and send to the dead. 
these and the other objects displayed in this final case are considered to have a special power to connect the material world of the living with the immaterial one of the dead. Like the Katamua stele and the other memorials in this exhibit, they reflect a common human desire to remember and be remembered in turn. I'd like to take this opportunity to remember the many people who have worked very hard uh, with us to bring this exhibit about, especially my co-curator, David Schloan, um, especially Chief, uh, Chief Curator Jack Green and Special Exhibits Coordinator Emily Teeter, as well as um, my family, past and present. And thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoy the show.